Thank you. It's uh, nice to be here. See a few familiar faces and meet a lot of people that I haven't met before. Um, so I'm going to uh, do a bit of a, a tour of the forecast package um, in R, which is a package that I wrote and it seems to get used fairly widely. Um, I'm not going to do the I'm not going to talk about the mathematics behind the methods. Um, I'm just going to show you how they work and when they're appropriate and, and things like that. So firstly, a quick intro to time series in R. Um, the, the number one function that we use all the time is TS. So if you scan in some data and then the TS function um, just turns your numerical vector into a time series object and you add some attributes like frequency and when it starts. Um, so that's, that's a little example of Australian, Australian GDP. Um, it ha then has the object um, of class TS, uh, and you can do things, print and plot. So if you print, it does something smart, it prints it out in a nice table. If you plot, it does something smart and figures it's a time series and it does a line plot. Um, so everything I'm going to talk about today uses TS objects. There are other <coughs> time series classes um, in other packages, but TS is the class that's in the base stats package that everyone uses. If you're working with, inter um, with time series that are unequally spaced, then you'll need a different package. T the TS object is for equally spaced time series data. So it could be annual or quarterly or monthly or daily or weekly or anything that's equally spaced. Um, uh, here's another example. So this is annual data. This is electricity sales for South Australia from a consulting job I'm working on. And, um, so if it's, if it's quarterly, it'll print it out in a nice table like that. If it's annual, it'll just print it out as a numeric vector, but it'll tell you this is a time series, these are its attributes. Oh, okay. uh, if you've not used time series before, the very best place to start is the time series task view. Um, I hope everyone who uses R regularly is familiar with the task views, but these are pages on CRAN for lots of different topics where people curate a sort of a summary of the packages that are available. So the time series task view actually looked after by me um, and Achim Zielis, who's also a time series guy from Austria. Um, and it, uh, so that's the web page. You just type time series task view into Google, it'll be the first link. And uh, it'll covers all the time series packages we know about, which is quite a lot, and uh, has some comments on what they all do. So if the stuff I talk about today is not the sort of stuff you want to do, but you have some other thing you want to do, go there and it, there will probably be some comment or other about what's available. Um, we maintain this fairly regularly. As you can see, the last update was um, 19th of September, so it's, you know, every month or so there'll be a, we'll update it with stuff we know about. Okay, these are the packages that um, uh, I just wanted to mention. The forecast package is the one that I'm going to talk mostly about. That's where I stick all my methodology. So when I invent new methods for forecasting um, or develop some new functionality in forecasting, I'll stick it in that package, which is sort of my main baby. Uh, the other packages uh, that I work on tend to have data in them, um, or they're not to do with forecasting at all. Um, so the other packages that I've worked on are MCOMP, which has a lot of data from fo forecasting competitions. Uh, so if you trying out new methods, it's a good idea to check them on a lot of data sets and that's what, there's a thousand and one time series in the M data <coughs> set and there's three thousand and three time series in the M3 data set. All of those are in the M comp package so it's a, it's a real wind tunnel test for forecasting methods. Um, and these uh, three data sets are for, uh, these three packages are, contain data from books that I have written or am writing. Um, so the FMA is from my uh, book from 1998. The XSmooth is from my re more recent book on exponential smoothing. And FPP is my latest package, which is from a book that I'll tell you about later, but it's not here. Um, okay. So let me just switch over to using R itself. So I'm going to use FPP today. If you load FPP, it loads for the forecast package. So I just I've actually already done that. Um, and I'm going to use three examples. Um, the first one is, uh, so everything I'm going to say today, I'm going to base it around three examples. I thought that was the simplest way to show you the functions. 
They're, they're different. The beer is uh, annual beer production in Australia, which has uh, this shape. So you can see it uh, increased fairly rapidly through the 60s and 70s, sort of leveled off in the late 70s, and it's been slowly declining ever since for lots of interesting reasons that we won't go into here. But, um, so that's Australian beer production. The, um, the next one is uh, called A10. It's, a, uh, pharma it's the sales of pharmaceutical products in Australia. Um, it's, the, it's a drug classification. So all the drugs in Australia are classified into groups, and this is group A10, which happens to be, um, uh, I think it was asthmatic drugs and things like that. Um, so you can see that it's, um, it's highly seasonal. There's an increasing trend, and we want to try and forecast that into the future. This is from a consulting job I did for the federal government when they were having trouble um, uh, estimating the budget for the pharmaceutical benefits scheme. Um, I developed some methodology that helped them do it, and this was some of the data that I got from them when I was working on that. And then the third data set I want to look at is um, it's called Taylor, after a, a professor at Oxford Uni called James Taylor, because it came from one of his papers. Um, and it is uh, half hourly electricity demand um, for England and Wales. Um, I, I have loads of similar data for Australia, but I happen to have this easily available, so I used it. But it all looks the same. You can see that it has a... Um, I'll make it a bit bigger for you. It's in years, the scale? The... No, it's oh, in sorry. weeks. We it's in weeks. We so um, every one of these is a day. So it goes up and down every day um, because people use electricity more at some times of the day than others. These are weekends like this, and this is just for a, a period of, of about 12 weeks. Um, and electricity companies like to be able to forecast the next few days. Like that, that particular series is extremely well behaved and easy to forecast. Um, data that I've seen in Australia, I know is near as nicely behaved as that, which makes it more interesting. Um, okay, so the first thing I wanted to do is just show you that the forecast package does completely automated forecasting. If I just go um, plot the forecasts of beer, um, it'll do some forecasting. You don't know what it's done. I'll, by the end of the talk, you'll know what it's done. But this graph here is, gives you some forecast of the beer data. So you can see that it's picked up the downward trend and it's extended it. The blue line is the point forecasts. The orange interval is an 80% prediction interval. And the yellow is a 95% prediction interval. Um, so completely automated forecasting is, and I'll, I'll explain later, is actually a really useful thing to be able to do. So here is the forecasts of A10. It takes a little longer because the data sets um, is, is longer and there's a bit more complexity because it's seasonal. But it uh, shouldn't take too long to come back with some forecasts of those data. So what it says here while we're waiting is this is to do with what model um, it's chosen to use since I didn't, I didn't tell it what model, it just uh, came up with one. So here's completely automated forecast for this data. You can see it's picked up the increasing trend, it's picked up the seasonality, and it's... Uh, yeah. And that's uh, a reasonable job at projecting it forward. And then the third one, uh, this actually might take a while. This is the um, electricity demand of half hourly intervals. So it's um, significantly more complicated and a much longer series. So it'll take a little while to figure out what to do. But not too long, it's you know, a 30 second job. To do completely automated forecasting. There it is. Mm -hmm. um, so you can see it's uh, figured out what the pattern is and projected it forward. So what, a lot of my research is about how to do that, how to um, develop an algorithm that does that reliably and consistently and relatively fast so that you can throw a thousand time series at it and it won't give you junk. It gives you something that's, that's sensible. Okay, so let's um, just go back. So, um, I'm going to talk a little bit now about some very simple forecasting methods. But these are not serious forecasting methods. These are the benchmarks. If you can't beat these, you might as well go home. Um, so these are things that we want to try and at least do better than this. So the, the first one is you just take the average of all the data and you say that's my forecast for the next 
however long you want to forecast ahead. Um, so your forecast, which we'll write as y hat of time n plus h, given all the data up to time n, is equal to the to y bar. So that notation is, is what I'll use uh, when I, I'm not going to do much notation, but if I do, it'll be like this. So the, the hat means it's a forecast, the n plus h is what I'm, the time period I'm trying to forecast, and the n is how much data I'm going to use in constructing that forecast. So that's the mean method. The naive method means your forecasts are all equal to the last observed value. Um, so your y n plus h given n is just equal to y n. Um, it's a surprisingly good forecast for a lot of things. Uh, in particular, if you have an efficient stock market, you'll find it's very difficult to beat that forecast. Um, a lot of people lose a lot of money by using forecasts that are, they think are, are you know, gonna, gonna be useful to them, but if they just tested it against the naive, they realize that they might as well go home. Um, so the, uh, the seasonal naive is when you've got highly seasonal data, and then you just take it to whatever it was last year. So it's the same period. Now the formula looks a little complicated because you have to use this modular arithmetic, but all it's doing is saying that my forecast for next February is the whatever it was last February, and my forecast for next March is whatever it was last March, and so on into the future. Um, and then the, th the fourth one I wanted to mention is um, similar to the naive forecast, but your, your forecast is equal to your last observation plus the average change between observations during the historical data. So you add a little bit or subtract a little bit, depending on whether the change is positive or negative, over the period of the historical data. So then your forecasts are equal to the last observation plus, so this is the change from period to period, divide by n minus 1 gives you the average change from period to period, you add h of them if you're going h steps ahead. So it's, you're adding in h lots of the average change into the future. If you look at that for a while, and I'll get my second years to do this in one of their first weeks, just to show that that equals that, um, because they all cancel each other out. So, and if you look at this, you realise that actually all you're doing is drawing a line between the first observation and the last observation and extending it out, which is maybe not a particularly smart forecast, but it's, it's a benchmark. If you can't beat that, you might as well give up. So they're the four benchmarks that we're going to use and that I tend to use in forecasting um, when I'm trying to develop new methods. Okay, so here they are applied to the Australian annual beer production. Anyone tell me which one's which? So what's the blue line? It's the average, which in this case happens to be not too bad, just by a fluke because the last observation ended up not very far away from it. The red line? Wow. No, yeah. Naive, it's the last one. And the green one? It's drift. It's drift. drift. If you draw in that point with this point, you'll get the line that goes up like that. Um, so, in this particular case, none of them are very good forecasts. I can do a lot better than that, but they're, they're the benchmarks. Um, so in, in R, provided you've got the forecast package loaded, you can get any of these very easily. Mean F gives you the mean, um, H steps ahead, the naive. There's two versions of it. You can just go naive or you can go RWF, which stands for random walk forecast, because it's the, the forecast that arises if you have a random walk model. S naive and drift, uh, which is a random walk with a drift term added in. There's lots of other functions in the forecast package that will give you forecasts. Um, so the first four are the ones I've just shown you. The, uh, Croston does a method that's used in um, supply chain forecasting when you've got demand that's only occasional. So you might have might be forecasting the number of spare parts required per week, and you get numbers like zero, one, two, and three, but not, usually not much more. Uh, Croston's method is used for that. I will get going to demonstrate STLF later on. That's uh, <coughs> constructing a forecast from an STL decomposition of a time series. SES is simple exponential smoothing, Holtz method, holt Winters method, uh, a method based on splines, a method called the theta method, which I'm not going to talk about and I don't like at all, but um, other people use it, so I stuck it in the package. And then the forecast function is, um, well, I'll talk quite a bit about that. Um, so all of these things will give you a, an object that 
has a class called the forecast class, and that contains all the stuff that you need to know when you're um, doing analysis of forecasts. So it contains the original series, it contains the point forecasts, the prediction intervals, um, what forecasting method was used, all the residuals and the in-sample one-step forecasts, and all the stuff you need to know about um, when you're um, looking at different things. So um, maybe I'll just do a quick example. So if I'm, uh, suppose I use simple exponential smoothing, it doesn't matter whether you know what it is or not, for the beer data, Okay, so it's given me back um, some point forecasts, uh, the 80% interval, these two columns, and the 95% interval. Otherwise, have everyone seen RStudio in action before? I'm using RStudio here. Um, if you haven't tried it, I recommend having a go. Um, it's an alternative interface to R, instead of the, the usual R where you've got a command window and a graphics window and stuff. It's all in the one integrated development environment. Um, it's still in beta, but it's, uh, it's, it's, I, I think it's fantastic. I use it all the time. Um, so you can do things like, um, if, I, uh, if I'm just on that line up there, I just have to click run and it'll run that line. If I click source, it'll run everything in the file. If I highlight a section, it'll, uh, if I want to highlight those three lines, and then I can click run, it'll run those three lines. So it all, it all works nicely together. Um, I can see what objects are in my workspace over here. I can see what they are. Um, I can see the history, uh, what files are in my local directory. If I, if I want some help on, an, on something, it'll bring up the help over here. No, so it all just works really nicely together. And I think it's a huge advance for, for R compared to the, what you get. Otherwise, okay. oh, I was going to show you what this was. Wasn't I? So there's, that's what you get back. That's um, what gets printed to the screen. If I just show you what's in it, for some reason. Let's see. So you can see that it has. It's a class forecast, and it has all these things in it that you can. The, the, the methods that, like the print method and the plot method, will use those to construct things that are sensible. So all of these, uh, all of these functions produce the same ob same object class, which is why it all works so nicely together. You can print and they all look the same. You can plot, they all look the same. Um, and what the other thing is that the um, there's a lot of other forecasting stuff in R that other people have written that don't have this forecast class, but if you, if you use the forecast function on any other object, it'll convert it to this class. So you can, um, you know, it doesn't matter if you want to use struct TS or something, Andrew Harvey's state-space models, you can still get it in the same class and do all the same analysis. Um, okay, I need to talk a bit about how we decide whether something's accurate or not. Um, so very quickly, these are sort of obvious. So if Y is my observation and f is the forecast of that observation then the mean <coughs> absolute error is like that the mean squared error just the average of the squared differences the root mean squared error is like that so they're all typical statistical things to do mean absolute percentage error is a favorite by some business forecasters where instead of the absolute error you take the percentage error so you the difference divided by the actual observation times 100 um, the first three of those are scale dependent, of course. If you've got, if you're trying to measure how accurate do I forecast widgets compared to um, steamships, you, you're on a all different scale. You can't do that. Um, so one of the reasons that the map is popular is it puts everything on the same scale. Um, unfortunately, for a lot of time series, you get Ys that are close to zero, and then the map is, is undefined or infinite, um, or at least enormous. Uh, and then, you know, it's not so useful. Um, it also um, only makes sense if Y has a, z has a natural zero. If you're trying to forecast temperature and you're using Celsius, percentage errors make no sense at all because the zero doesn't, doesn't have any sort of real meaning in terms of things. It's an arbitrary point on the scale. Um, 
it doesn't make any sense to have a different percentage error for Fahrenheit than Celsius, um, but you would get a different percentage error if you did use this formula. So that's, you can only use this if, if the zero means something um, in real, real things. So here's a, an alternative that um, I developed a few years ago to try to measure forecast accuracy when you've got things on a different scale. And you just take the absolute differences, but you scale them all, and the Q, the scale, has to be some measure of the scale of the time series. Um, so this is in an International Journal of Forecasting paper um, from 2006. So what, what's, what's the Q? Well, if you've got a non-seasonal time series, a good Q to use is the, um, the average differences um, from period to period. By the way, you wouldn't want to use, say, the standard deviation because for time series, that's not necessarily well behaved. It can change, it can grow and shrink and do funny things over time. You want something that's stable. Um, in, I said stable measure. So the average differences, absolute differences, is usually stable for time series. So that works okay. If it's seasonal, that makes more sense to look at the average annual differences. Um, that tends to work well. For other things, you can use other cues, but as long as it's something that's stable and measures the scale. Um, so here's our three uh, benchmark methods. Um, that's the real data, that black line there. Um, so you can see that the drift didn't work too well. The naive and the mean didn't do too badly um, in this particular case. And so I do that calculation. So I'm calculating the difference between the, the black is my y's, the coloured lines are the different F's, and I'm plugging them into those previous formula, and I get uh, results that look like that. So the root mean squared error, the mean absolute error, the mean absolute percentage error, and the mean absolute scaled error. And you can see which one does best, and for these data, the naive method does better on all, all the measures. Sometimes you'll get a, one method will do better on one measure, and another method will do better on another measure, and then you have to decide which one you prefer. But often, if it does better on one, it'll do better on them all. How do I get that? We just um, go <coughs> the So what I'm doing here is I'm... Uh, I have my font turned up really large so you can see it from the back of the room, but it means that I'm trying to work in a really little space. Um, so first of all, I, I want to hold back some of the data because I want to test how good my forecasts are. So I, I set up a... I take the beer data and I say, only go up to the end of 1999, um, and I'll call that my beer train, as in training data, and uh, <coughs> my test data will be from then on, um, and I've done the same with the A10 as well, and uh, so if I, if I run those two lines, and I'll get the, the forecasts, just to show you, there's the forecast from the naive method, is the window part of the package? Uh, okay. uh, no, window is part of um, the stats package. Yeah. Um, so when you're working with time series, it's a really useful function if you want to grab a bit of the time series because it preserves all the properties. If you do the usual subset thing with a square bracket and then which indices you want, you lose all your properties. So I always use window when I'm working, when I'm working with time series. Okay, so... Uh, if I just go accuracy F1, it'll give me the in-sample fit accuracy, which is not actually that useful for forecasting. That's how well the model fitted in-sample. But it doesn't tell me how well it's going to forecast, and the model can be really good in-sample and really bad out-of-sample. So, um, so those lines are not really what I want. What I want is these lines. So this gives me the accuracy of forecast 1 on where the out-of-sample data is beer test. So that's all you do, and it'll print you back actually print you more than the, the four things I've defined, but these are the various measures of forecast accuracy that you can get out of it. So accuracy is part of the forecast package. So those numbers, that's where they came from. So it's very, very easy, you just give it some forecasts, you give it some data and it'll sort out how to do it. What's the default Q? Uh, for for, for non-seasonal data, it's... Um, the difference between consecutive, the absolute differences between consecutive observations averaged. For seasonal data, it's the seasonal differences averaged. 
Um, and if you want some other queue, you'll have to write your own function because it doesn't allow you to input other options. Okay, so that's enough of uh, sort of these toy methods and uh, accuracy. I want to show you some real methods. Um, so exponential smoothing has been around since the 1950s. Um, and until about 10 or 15 years ago, it was not really treated very seriously by statisticians because it was thought to be a fairly ad hoc sort of thing that people in business did, but it wasn't a serious statistical model. Um, so in my first book in 1998, that's sort of the perspective that was, that was um, presented there, that these are sort of these ad hoc methods that don't really have a statistical model behind them, but they're useful in business forecasting. Um, but it was actually in 1997 that the first paper came out that showed that there was an underlying model. Um, the paper came out just after we finished the book. Uh, the book wasn't published till the following year. So um, I got interested in that and uh, spent um, about 10 years then trying to work out all the theoretical properties of exponential smoothing methods and develop the statistical algorithms behind them. And that turned into my second forecasting book, um, which is the sort of the modern approach to exponential smoothing, which gives it a much more sort of statistical flavour. There's a proper model, there's likelihood calculations and Akaiki's information criteria and prediction intervals and all the things you would expect from a, from a proper model. Um, so the uh, exponential smoothing facilities in R uh, reflect this history. What's in the stats package is um, uh, actually does basically what's in my first book and what's in the forecast package does what's in my second book. The forecast, so what's in the forecast package is much better than what's in the stats package because it's taken into account you know, another 10 years of research and, and a lot of research over that period. Okay, so exponential smoothing methods, I'm not going to give you the equations, but intuitively what's happening is you've got a trend and you've got a seasonal component and you add these or multiply these things together to get different shapes. So you can have um, no trend at all, additive trend, damped additive trend, multiplicative trend, damped multiplicative trend, and you can have no seasonality, additive seasonality, or multiplicative seasonality. And then we just combine these letters together to refer to different exponential smoothing methods. <coughs> so simple exponential smoothing has no trend and no seasonality, so that's that cell in the table. Um, Holtz linear method is equivalent to this cell where there's an additive trend but no seasonality. Um, Holt-Winter's additive method is additive trend and additive seasonality. Holt-Winter's multiplicative method actually has additive trend but multiplicative seasonality, um, and so on. So these are all different methods. Um, and in this table, then, there are 15 different exponential smoothing methods. Um, okay, so all that was, or most of that, apart from the last line, was known in 1998. And so the whole winter's function, which is in the stats package, so when you, when you fire up R, that's auto automatically loaded for you, um, it will implement only these four methods, the simple exponential smoothing halts and the two halt winter's variation. Um, and it does the estimation heuristically, it's not a proper estimation, um, and it minimises some of the parameters by mean squared error, but some of the parameters it minimises using heuristic methods, because that's what people did for... 30 or 40 years. Um, the ETS function in the forecast package does all the models um, and it uses likelihood estimation. So here's, uh, here's an example. This is using the ETS variation of the function. So that's simple exponential sweep, no trend, no seasonality. So it's very similar to naive in this case. It's not always similar to naive, but in this case it is. Um, Holtz method picks up the fact that there's a bit of a downward trend here and extrapolates it. Damped halts, um, the trend is not so strong, it's actually, um, the damp trend means that it starts off at the same rate and then levels out to be horizontal. So it, if it's going <coughs> up, it'll flatten out. If it's going down, it'll flatten out like that. Um, and then we have an automatic uh, model selection, which in this case gives you virtually the same answer as halts. Uh, and there's the the real data. So you can see the automatic method does a pretty good job here. Okay, so there's the... These numbers are what we had up before. Here's the new line. Um, so this is 
the automatic exponential smoothing model uh, and you can see that the mace is about half, MAPE is about half, I mean absolute error is about half and the root mean squared error is a little more than half. So it's made a big difference to the accuracy just by <coughs> using a fancier method. Okay, here's uh, the A10 data, so this is the pharmaceutical data which is seasonal. Whole winter's additive is not a very good forecast for these data because it's additive seasonality, so it's trying to fit the same seasonal shape and add it on, and so it just takes the average of the seasonal pattern, and because the seasonal pattern's increasing, the average seasonal pattern is somewhere in about this size instead of this size, and so when it adds it on, it's obviously not very good. Um, the multiplicative seasonality does a lot better because it's multiplying up the seasonal effect, so as the seasonal effect gets bigger, um, it allows for that and extends it, so that's that. And the automated approach gives a different answer from the red line, but it's not very different, um, and it does a, does a pretty good job. Um, oh, and there's the, the black line is the actuals, which is getting hard to see what's going on there, but the automated approach does, does the best. So how do I do that? Um, let me just make my window bigger so you can see what I'm doing. Okay, so if I want to fit a particular model, I tell it I want to fit that model, ANN. Uh, I haven't explained the first, the first letter yet. Um, I'll come to that. Um, so that's no trend and no seasonality. And damn false, that gives you a particular model. If you want it to let it choose, and I recommend you do because it will usually do a better job than you will, um, <laughs> just don't put anything and it will just go and find something appropriate. And then, um, that's pretty quick, so that's the first one done, second one done. Forecasts, forecasts, spot them. Make that a bit bigger so you can see there what it's done. Okay. Um, okay, so the notation, the ETS notation there stands for error, trend and seasonal. This is the trend and the seasonal. The other bit is the error. Um, it also stands for exponential smoothing. So the, um, the, the error just means whether you add the errors on or you multiply the errors on um, to the point forecasts. So ANN is simple exponential smoothing with additive errors. AAN is Holtz method with additive errors. Additive Holtz winters with additive errors. But if I have an M in the front, it means multiplicative Holtz winters with multiplicative errors. So there's actually 30 um, models now. Because I've got all the original 15, plus I've got two lots of errors that I can put on them. However, 11 of them are numerically unstable, so we don't use them. So there's actually only 19. Um, so when I, when you, in, in R, when I go, um, <coughs> okay, this line here, when I say fit an ETS model, it goes away, fits all 19 of them, um, figures out which one's doing the best job, and just gives you that one back. And then it figures <coughs> out what's best using ECO information criteria. Um, so here's, uh, okay, so that's just another example of its use. These are all the parameters, all the arguments, I mean, for the function. There's lots and lots of things. In general, leave them alone unless you know what you're doing, because um, I choose the argument, I choose the defaults to give you sensible results. Um, and I get email all the time from people all over the world with questions about it, and more than 50% of the time, if they just left the arguments alone, it would have worked. Um, uh, but if you want to know about them, read the help file. The other 50% other of them, if they read the help file, they wouldn't have been asking them. <laughs> <laughs> they actually put a lot of time into the help file, and they do contain good information. Um, but you can control all sorts of stuff. Um, if you try to, if you fit a model and you print it, you, you just type fit to see what it looks like, it comes back like this. So it'll give you all the parameters in the model, which if you don't know what an exponential smoothing model is, you won't, that won't mean much to you. Um, it'll give you the sigma, which is the standard deviation of the residuals, and it'll give you these guys, which is the AIC, Akaiki's information criteria, corrected AIC, and the Bayesian information criteria. And what it's doing, these are, um, I'm assuming people might have seen this sort of things before. It's, um, 
certainly if you've done any statistics at university in the last 10 years, you should have seen them. If you did statistics um, when I did it in the 1980s, you wouldn't have seen them because it wasn't really part of the statistical vernacular. But um, these are uh, measures of how good the model is. And for forecasting, the AIC is really useful because asymptotically, it's um, a measure of the, how well the model fits out of sample. Um, it's on a different, it's on a funny scale, so it's not, I can't sort of tell you what that means in mean squared error terms, but it is a measure of how well the model fits out of sample. So you minimise the AIC, you get a good model. And what ETS does is, that's what it does, it fits all these 19 models, looks at the AIC and gives you back the one with the smallest AIC. Um, okay, let's move along. So the, that's what it does. It can, uh, it'll do any, any of the combinations, it'll give you prediction intervals, it'll make sure the parameters are nicely behaved. It gives you an object of class ETS, um, which you can then stick into a forecast um, and, and get the forecast. So in the, in the R code, you'll notice what I did there. Um, once I fitted my model using fit2 there, I then just stick that fit into the forecast function and tell it I want h equals 8, that's forecast horizon equals 8, so it'll give me one step, two step, up to eight step forecasts in that line there. That's all you do. Um, so you fit the model, you give some forecasts, and away you go. Um, so this was based on an algorithm um, which is described in my, my exponential smoothing book. Very hard to beat that algorithm, actually. Um, if you, um, we tried it on um, the M3 day competition after the competition closed, so we weren't officially ent an entry in the competition. And for the first up to four forecast horizons for any seasonal data, we beat everybody in the competition just using this algorithm. So um, after four horizons, other methods tend to do, do a little better. But for the first four, um, I don't know of a method that does better than this sort of if it's just applied generally. Uh, there's lots of methods to give you things like summaries and residuals and so on. Um, okay. uh, another, another cool thing that you sometimes do in forecasting is you fitted um, a model to your training data and instead of wanting to know the forecasts <coughs> um, sort of one step, two step, three step, up to eight steps ahead, you want forecasts, one step forecasts for all of the future periods. So you want to know what's the forecast What's the next forecast? That's easy. But what's the one step forecast if I knew that data but I didn't change my model? Okay, so your model's based on your first, your training set, but you want a one step forecast based on um, future data. Um, that's actually quite a useful thing to do. Um, if you're interested in how well does my model do one step forecasting, you can then apply it to different data sets but get one step forecasts all the time. Um, and the ETS will just do that. You just, um, if you shave your, you train it on your original data, and then on your new data, you just say ETS, new data, but use the old model. So instead of going and fitting a new model, it'll use the old model and calculate all of the results accordingly. Um, okay, I just wanted to say something about automatic forecasting, since it's, I've spent a lot of time doing automatic forecasting and developing new algorithms. Um, and uh, there's several reasons for it. Firstly, most people that do forecasting are not very expert. Um, even if they've done a class or two at university, they haven't really learned enough to be considered expert forecasters. Um, and I'd rather them get some good results than bad results. Um, also now the algorithms are at the point where I can't beat them. And I've been sort of fiddling around doing forecasting for more than 20 years. I mean, if, if you give me a data set, um, I can rarely do a better model than if I just gave it to one of these algorithms. Um, the algorithms are that good now, so um, why not use them? The, um, the, the reason I first started doing this is because I had a lot of clients who would come to me and they'd say, we've got to do a thousand forecasts every week. Um, and we just don't have the, the person power to be able to do that. Um, so you need an automatic algorithm. So these are companies that might have um, they might have a thousand products, uh, or even if they've only got 20 products, but 50 outlets, and they need to forecast 
the amount of product needed at each outlet every week. Um, so you have to have some way of doing that automatically uh, or you, you, you're not going to be able to meet demand. Um, also, some more sophisticated multivariate methods need forecasts of time series as inputs to them, and you need a lot of them. Um, and so, even if you just got one problem you're working on, you sometimes need inputs that involve lots of forecasts. Uh, so some of my work on forecasting population needs a lot of uh, time series forecasts to sort of input to the procedure. I can't do them all um, by hand, but I can do them all automatically. So that's why, why I'm interested in this problem. Um, okay. Just wondering how we go off the time. It's already 7 o'clock. I'm not going to get all this done. I don't know which bit I might do. How many people know what a Box Cox transformation is? Not many. Okay. I'll briefly tell you about Box Cox transformations and then I'll do a rerun and then we might have to finish. Um, so, um, if, I, uh, if I go to my. Set here. So you've got the, the variation is increasing with the level and if I want an additive model where things all add together nicely, I, I can't deal with data like that because it, everything sort of multiplies up rather than adds up. So I could take logs for example and that would do a pretty good job if I just take logarithms of those data. Um, so it's now much more, much better behaved, and I can try and fit an additive model to that. The idea of a box Cox transformation is to sort of make that more general. Um, so, um, so here it is. So it has a parameter lambda. If lambda is zero, you take logs. If lambda is some other number, you do this transformation. So you take y to the power of lambda minus one divided by lambda, which is really, if lambda is a half, it's just a square root with a linear adjustment afterwards. Um, if lambda is 1, it's just basically doing nothing. If lambda is minus 1, you're inverting 1 on y2 with a little adjustment afterwards. So the linear adjustment's not doing anything really to the shape. It's there so that um, everything works smoothly when you try and estimate things. So let me just show you an example. This is um, So that's my um, A10 data. Now what I'm going to do is slowly decrease lambda and you'll see how the shape of the graph changes. Okay, and around about there, it's looking pretty good. And then it goes too far. And so now the variation at this end is too small compared to the variation down there. You're trying to balance out the variation. Okay, so... Um, And then, so the idea is you do one of these transformations, you forecast off the transform data, and then you back transform under the original scale. Um, in the forecast package, it's really easy. You don't even have to n figure out the transformation yourself. If you just say box cox dot lambda and give it the data set, it'll come back with something that's pretty good. Um, it comes back in this case with 0 0.131. Then you say, I want to fit the model. Um, there's my data. I want lambda to be like, to be equal to whatever value I got here, and I only want to consider additive models. If you do that, it'll give you um, something that's pretty good. There it is. So, what that's done is found a transformation, fitted an additive model, undone the transformation, and given me the results. And you can see it actually does a nice job. Sorry, um, how did you do that animation before? Like changing that? I'll tell you my presentation tricks later. <laughs> <laughs> it's a LaTeX trick, actually, to do. I generated lots of slides, and then I, in late, this was a LaTeX presentation, and then I just animated. You know, um,
Thank you. So that's a very quick intro to box box transformations. They're really useful. If you've got data that's not well behaved, you can do one of these things and then you, you can do it in regression too. You can get rid of some nasty effects. Okay. Um, now I can't really do a REMA forecasting any justice, but I just wanted to tell you what functions they exist to do it. Um, so there is an, in the stats package there is a function called a REMA that does a nice job of the estimation. Um, however, it does something funny with the constant, so you can't <coughs> have a constant um, in the model if you do any differencing. Um, it doesn't return everything you need for the forecast function. It, so you, if you fit a model this way, you can't actually use the forecast function. Um, it won't allow refitting the model on new data, which I sometimes use. So I, I just wrote a wrapper to it, which is a REMA with a capital A, which calls <coughs> the little REMA function but adds the bits I need to do the forecasting. So if you just use capital A REMA, um, it works, all the arguments are the same, so it works exactly the same way, but it'll uh, package things up a bit nice, more nicely. But if you don't know what you're doing, and a REMA modeling is actually pretty hard, use auto.arema, and it will find a model for you. Um, so, uh, well, there's all the arguments for the auto.arema function. Let me just demonstrate it. <coughs> Okay. Um, so if I, I won't do this now because we're not having a lot of time, but the first few lines of, were me figuring out what sort of a REMA model worked. And using the stuff that I would teach my second years, I came up with this model. If I, um, you just run that model. Okay, so then if I just go auto.arema, it's very fast, see so it's come back with a model already. Um, it won't be the same model that I picked. Um, but it will have picked its own model. Then I want to forecast it. So I'll forecast from both models, and I'll plot the forecasts from, there's my model, and there's the forecasts from the uh, model that it picked. And uh, you see the model that it picked has, this, if you can just make that out, it's picked up the downward trend. Um, okay, if we go back to the, another nice thing about RStudio, you can go back to previous plots, mm -hmm. all your histories there. Um, if I go back to mine, Actually, yeah, I don't think that was such a good forecast. Looked looked good when I was doing the fitting, but I didn't come up with some good forecasts. Okay, so the auto.arema algorithm um, is, uh, was a paper I did a few years ago. Again, lots of arguments. If you just give it some data, it will almost always give you back something better than what you will do yourself. Um, I'll skip that slide. I might skip the stuff on. So how are we going for time? Well, who wants me to finish? Go as long as you want. Okay. Um, I'll skip the last section, but I will do seven and eight. Um, but I wanted to show you how to do the Taylor's the Taylor's data. Um, so that the Taylor's data, the half hourly electricity demand data, so that has a 48 um, length period per day and a 336 length period per week, because that's 336 half hours per week. And because of week the weekend effect, I do need to allow for the full 336. So that's a long, that's a lot of seasonality. ETS will let you go up to 24. Um, and then it just becomes too hard, because you're estimate, with ETS, you're estimating one parameter for every season. So if I've got 24, that's 24 parameters, plus three or four other parameters. And that's, a, that's really hard to estimate. Um, in fact, it's beyond really what you should be doing if you're with 24. Um, Arima, um, <coughs> theoretically, will let you go up to 350. In practice, you will usually run out of memory long before that. Um, and if you try fitting an Arima model to seasonality of even 50, like <coughs> weekly data of 52, um, it will take forever or it'll run out of memory or something will go wrong. Um, so with this sort of high frequency data, mm -hmm. you're, you're a bit stuck. Um, so STL um, is, is one approach that works pretty well. So let me just skip all that. Okay. Okay, so you remember the Taylor data? It looks like that. So STL does a decomposition of the data into a seasonal bit, a trend bit, and a remainder bit. 
Um, so the seasonal bit picks up this pattern, but it replicates it almost. Uh, I have allowed it to change slightly over the, the time, but not much. Um, the trend, uh, there's not much trend here, but there's a little bit. See, so it dips down and back up again, so that's captured here. The grey bar here is the same length as this grey bar. Okay, so it shows you this has expanded a lot. And then what's left over is there. So the idea here is uh, you can remove the seasonality, and I can just subtract the seasonality from the original data. Um, and then I'm left with something that's non-seasonal, which is much easier to deal with. So I forecast the non-seasonal data, and then I have to re-seasonalise it to make it back on the original scale. Because the seasonality is so stable, all I do is grab the last season, this last bit, and just add that bit on. Um, so if it's been changing over time, it's fine. I just grab the last one. Um, and it does an amazingly good job. Uh, okay, so that there is... That's the, non -se that's the seasonally adjusted data. That's after subtracting the seasons. You can see there's not much left there. Then I can forecast... Uh, I forecast the... Um, OK, so what I want to do is to forecast that and then add it in. I can do it in one step. I just go forecast tailor.stl. Tailor.stl is the original decomposition. I just forecast that and then I'll plot it. long series, just to think a little bit. There we go, that's done. And you can see it's done, done a pretty good job. So you can do any high frequency data with that trick by deseasonalizing, forecast the non-seasonal bit, and then re-seasonalizing. Um, you don't even have to do the, um, the seasonal adjustment bit, you just can do it in one, one line, STLF. You should know by now I like these one line automatic <laughs> it just does it for you. So STLF will do everything um, like that. Is there any chance you can show us the, um, the forecast for the seasonally adjusted? Yeah. Uh, so I'll plot the forecast seasonally adjusted data from our STL. It won't be very interesting. So it's picked up the last bit. It's noticed there's a bit of a pattern in here, which is probably seasonality that it didn't quite estimate well, so it's tried to put that back in in the forecast period. And um, because this is wandering around a lot, it's allowed... So the width of these tells you that it doesn't actually <coughs> know what's going to happen um, because, it, because it can do this historically. There's no reason why it can't do that in the future to reflect that. Um, there's a new function that's just gone in which uh, will do this, uh, will allow something like exponential smoothing but with two seasonal periods. So in, in um, the Taylor's case, the two seasonal periods are 48 and 336. And it does a reasonable job, but it only works with two seasonal periods. So there's, so there's the line, it's just DSHW, Taylor, and you give it both periods. Um, so we could do daily and annual. I'm thinking about yes. that dissolved oxygen data that we've talked about, where you've got a daily cycle as well as an annual. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, that should work as long as you don't have a weekly one as well. And you shouldn't, if it's a natural yeah. phenomenon, you don't normally have a weekly. One. No. It's only when it's a human. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but STL might be a better option. Yeah. Um, Okay, see so it takes a little time to do this because there's a lot of parameters to estimate. I'll come back to it. Um, this is the area that I'm working on most at the moment, is dealing with multiple seasonal periods and more complicated things like you get... Um, in, in Turkey, electricity demand has two seasonal patterns, one for the Islamic year and one for the Gregorian year, mm -hmm. and they don't 
they're not um, they're not uh, they don't line up because they're aperiodic. So trying to deal with that is an interesting problem. Um, if you've got weekly data, your period is actually not 52; it's 52 and a bit. Um, and if you have long enough series of weekly data, that bit actually makes a difference. So I'm trying to work on methods for that sort of thing. I, the theory's done. The paper's about to come out in JASA. Um, the code was written twice so far, and we're still not happy with it, so we won't release it until we're happy. But that's, that's sort of the next big thing in the forecast package. There we go. Still going. Um, uh, OK. So um, the forecast function works in two ways. You either give it a model, and it'll give you some forecasts. And the model can be almost anything. It's got methods for handling it. Or you give it a time series, and it will give you back some forecasts completely automatically. If you give it a time series, it'll, if the seasonal period is less than 13, it'll use ETS. If the seasonal period is bigger than 13, it'll use STL. Um, that's what's going on. When I, when I gave you the first three examples, I said it's completely automated forecasting, and that's what it was doing. Um, still going. Okay. And I think we'll stop. As this is done, we'll stop. <laughs> As you can see, once you do these multiple seasonal things, it does take a long time because there's a lot of estimation going on. And our new stuff is m more complicated than this, so um, it's even slower. Okay, so there's double seasonal hot winters. No prediction intervals, unfortunately, because this method doesn't have any theory that gives you prediction intervals. Our new methods will um, when we finally get them fast enough to release on the public. Okay, I'll stop there. Uh, two other, sorry, I was going to stop there. Two other things. Um, if you want the slides or all the code that I just used, go to my webpage. Um, there's the slides, there's the examples. Click on them, download them. You can run all the same stuff. Um, when I was preparing this, I came across, I'm always coming across little things that need fixing, so I upgraded the forecast package to version 3.10 this morning. Um, so uh, I think everything will run with an older version, but if it doesn't, make sure you've got 3.10, because it does run with that, because I just did it. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is I'm actually working on a new book, um, which will be free and online, um, and will replace my 1998 book, and it will be based around R, and the forecast package. Um, so some of it's there. If you want to have a look, you go robjheinman.com slash FPP um, for forecasting principles and practice. I'm not sure that that will be the address when we finally finish it, but that's where it is at the moment. Um, and it's, uh, okay, so you can see there's R code in little boxes that collapse. Um, you can go to any section by just clicking on the table on the on the right, um, so these are collapsible. To move between sections, it's searchable, um, and all the all the code will run uh, as long as you have the FPP package, which is associated with the book. So um, we're hoping that uh, come March next year, at least the first eight chapters will be finished, because we're teaching it in a course at Monash, and so we have to be have a fair bit of it done. Um, so uh, yeah, so that's the, that's my latest project, and that's why the FPP package is is being developed. No, I really will stop now. <laughs> you can't sit down yet. <laughs> <laughs>